Hi, I'm Maria Thea Harrelsovello Sos on social media, and today is a special So Over 50 podcast. Now grab a cuppa and get ready to be inspired by us. So Organised Style Podcast acknowledges traditional owners of country throughout Australia. We pay our respects to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures and to the Elders past, present and emerging. Welcome back to this special So Over 50 episode on So Organised Style Podcast. So Over 50 intersects with all communities. Many sewers have said how Wendy Ward's sewing books have helped them develop their new love for sewing. I really appreciate the work that goes into Wendy Ward's books through her earlier publications. In my case, it was a beginner's guide to sewing with knitted fabrics. Wendy has now written five sewing publications and having her on the podcast is an absolute thrill for me and I hope it is for you too. So let's give a warm welcome to Wendy. How are you, Wendy? Hi, Maria. Thanks for having me on. I'm fine, thank you. Just a bit hot because it's the middle of summer here in the UK. And yeah, us Brits aren't very aren't very well equipped at dealing with the hot weather. I'm really pleased that you've got warm weather because it's a wee bit chilly here in Sydney at the moment. Oh, yeah. Well, let's just say I'm avoiding it. I'm not a sun worshipper. So it's nice to be sat in the cool chatting to you. Wonderful. Thank you. I know that you've recently published How to Sew Sustainably, and that's amazing to do that this year with everything that has happened or not. So, I mean, it's 2021 and you've just published How to Sew Sustainably. How did you get all of that organised while everyone's been in lockdown? Talk us through that. It's it's another book that I've I've kind of wanted to write for a while, really, because I write quite a lot on my blog about sustainable fashion and sewing sustainably, and it, it's something I I am really passionate about. And I first proposed it to my publisher about a month or so before Sewing Basics for Everybody came out. I think I first suggested it around the kind of late autumn, early winter in 2019. I wasn't completely convinced that they'd go for it. But yeah, after a bit of to and fro and discussions, credit to them, they said, yeah, let's do it. Which I'm quite amazed about, really, because what I'd proposed and obviously what the book became, it is a bit different from the other books that I've done. So, you know, it's not just dressmaking. It includes other kinds of projects, sewing for the home, accessories, kind of more textile art stuff. There are a few bits in there of kind of more, slightly more extended writing just on the whole subject. So yeah, I was really happy when they said, yeah, let's go for it. So I had that confirmed in January, 2020. So yeah, so, you know, kind of in a way for me, just talking kind of completely from my point of view, it kind of helped 2020, really, because I had this lovely big project to keep me occupied that I could do at home. So, you know, in the fortunate position that I had work, work that I could do at home. So really, in terms of my working life, I didn't feel a massive difference last year. All my teaching stopped, which was a shame. That's the main thing that changed for me. And because I had the book to work on, I didn't do what I know a lot of teachers have done and switch over to online teaching. I thought, well, I'm I'm just going to use this time just to really focus on this book and and really enjoy it being my my sort of main focus, really. So, yeah, it was a bit of a gift. It sounds like you were being more mindful about the project than you would have been in the past with your projects. Yeah, well, I had more time. So I had that time to kind of really, really think through stuff, which I don't know, in some ways, I have to say, it's not necessarily always a good thing because I work quite well to quite a tight deadline because it makes me just focus things in my head and make decisions and go, right, this is what I'm doing. Whereas I think if, you know, given time to kind of mull things over, yeah, it's a nice thing, but sometimes it yeah, some, it's not necessarily always a great thing, but yeah, it worked for me. And the only other thing that was different 
was I wasn't able to go to the photo shoots for the book. That's a big shame as well, because I love going to photo shoots. I work with a really nice team, a really brilliant photographer called Julian Ward, who I've worked with on all my books. And he's he's just an amazing photographer, lovely person, totally gets what I'm doing. And a really lovely stylist called Nell Haynes, who similarly we've got quite similar tastes so again she knows what I'm what I'm trying to achieve and it's just really lovely spending a day with them at photo shoots and it's really lovely kind of because working on a book is is really solitary you know I'm a lot of the time I'm on my own I'm in my own head I'm you know working on this this thing and I have this vision but at the photo shoot days that vision sort of starts to turn into reality and it's, it's a really, really lovely process, sort of seeing these things that I've made come to life and working in a creative way with other people that I don't often get a chance to do. They're, they're really fun days. So, uh, yeah, I was really sad not to be able to go to them, but they did an amazing job and I was, I was really lucky that I totally trusted them to do it under their own steam without me. You've done five books. You've published them. You said that you work in your head and you have an aim of what it's going to look like. Do you have a process that you go through? Yeah. So, I mean, I have to have quite a clear idea of the content and structure of the book before I start it, before it's even commissioned, because the publisher kind of need, need to have a pretty good idea of what they're commissioning. So, yeah, I have quite a clear structure to start with. And then I just work backwards from my deadlines and just systematically work through it. I tend to work on the projects first. I'll kind of make my samples, writing my notes up as I go along, making notes for any particular difficulties or problems or things to look out for for readers and making notes about techniques that I'm going to include as I go along as well. I mean, like, like we were saying about, about having time and working to deadlines, even though I did have the luxury of just having that book to focus on last year, my timekeeping wasn't brilliant. <laughs> 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 Which kind of proves what I said, that I do respond to a bit of pressure, but my publisher was very understanding about it. So, And they had their own challenges as well with people on furlough and not being able to be in the office and I think arranging photo shoots was quite difficult and had to be put on hold for a long time. In the main, I was able to stick to my usual process that I use. So. You know, you've written this book about sustainability. Where have you come from to be able to write this book? So I think it all started right at the end of my degree. And when I started writing my dissertation, I managed to get a little bit of work experience with a small startup company that were making a small range of clothes from organically grown fair trade cotton. So I did about a few weeks work experience with them. And then the focus of my dissertation was all about issues about the environment and fashion and how the two were kind of rather in conflict, shall we say. So that was year 2000 and we'd not had any lectures or anything like that about issues to do with the environment and the fashion industry there were things happening but it was quite a new thing then none of the other students on my year were doing anything sort of remotely like that I got interested in it then and after graduating I worked for a UK-based fashion retailer that you would class as a a fast fashion retailer called Matalan. So I got quite a good graduate role there. I was their only, their sole boys wear designer. It was quite a challenge. I was churning out designs, basically sat at a computer all day churning out designs. And it was quite... A bit soul destroying for a graduate, really, but it, it was it was quite a good insight into how a, a fast fashion company works. At that time, two thousand, I very rarely saw a physical sample of any of my designs, 
the buyers that I worked with didn't seem to know where the clothes were made. I even asked them. No one knew where the clothes were made, it seemed, or under what conditions, or, yeah, very rarely saw a sample. So that was pretty demoralising. And then the company that I'd done the work experience for in my degree, they were able to offer me a job. So I went to work for them, which was amazing, and the complete other end of the spectrum. So I went on trips to India to work with small-scale cooperative groups that were making clothes for us I learned a lot about cotton production it was a great opportunity hands-on got involved in everything so that was great were you still doing boys wear or did you branch out in your design I then was doing kind of everything really there was only me and the two people that started the company we were quite limited in what we could do but it was kids, babies, men's, women's. And we started out doing just nightwear. And then we decided to try doing a range of clothing design for yoga. And that did really well. That sold in Harrods for a while. Yeah, that was a great experience. It's interesting that you've gone from an everyday sort of item through to a, a like a niche yoga design. How did you get to that point? Um, I think it was thinking about the kind of people that would be interested in organic fair trade cotton, because obviously that was its main kind of selling point. And yeah, we, we kind of did lots of research and thought, actually, this might be a good match. And actually, I started doing yoga around that time. And I still do quite a lot of yoga now. So yeah, that's quite nice. That's good. You've kept it up. Yeah, yeah. And um, while I was working for that company, I also did a part-time MA, which was looking at ways to recycle textiles. So I was looking at lots of different parts of issues around sustainability and the environment in the fashion industry. And when you had the idea about writing the book, would the idea that you'd had Would that have been easier for you to then present to the publishers or did you have to think it through a little bit more than you would have with the guides to sewing that you've already published? Yeah, I think probably did a lot more thinking and research around how I presented it to them in terms of who it would appeal to. Because I think, you know, all my other books have been just dressmaking. And I know a lot of people that do quilting and other kinds of sewing also do dressmaking they're not exclusive but I thought a book that included lots of different sorts of sewing will then reach a wider audience and but the subject of sewing in a more sustainable way also is not exclusive to just dressmaking so yeah seems I did quite a good job of that (laughs) because they went for it (laughs) So when you were doing the projects to go into the sustainability book and you were working on them last year and you said that you did your projects first, was that an easy process for you to do to go from garment making to all of the other things that you developed for the book? Yeah, it was a really nice opportunity actually because a lot of the stuff that I've included were things that when I first started teaching, so I first started teaching in... 2007 and I taught in about three or four different adult ed centres when I lived in Brighton and I didn't just teach dressmaking classes then I also taught two other courses one just called recycled textiles and another one called alterations so in the recycled textiles one we did no dressmaking and it was very much the projects in the book that are more art-based projects. That was a lot of the stuff that I taught back then in that course. And in the alterations class, we did a lot of basic alterations, hems, taking things in, letting things out, but also a little bit of kind of customising and modifying clothes. And both of them courses were always really popular. It it really nice to go back to that. And you know, when you weren't doing the garment sewing and it ended up being, you know, using textiles for art, 
did any of the students also want to use textiles for mending applications? Yes, actually. And it would be mending clothes. So a lot of the places that I taught those courses were in very local kind of outreach centres in maybe more deprived communities that were organised and run by the adult ed centres that I worked at. A lot of the people that I taught in those classes were maybe people who might have been isolated in some way or not accessing any kind of training or education for one reason or another and often didn't have an awful lot of money because the courses were quite heavily subsidised too. So a lot of them people did have stuff that they loved but needed mending. So they were finding new ways to mending stuff a because it might have been physically damaged stained got a hole in it got a tear in it something needed replacing or stuff that they kind of liked but they just didn't really wear very much anymore for one reason or another but it was still a perfectly good garment not damaged still fitted so a bit of customizing modifying which I think you could also call repair, really. Yeah. Brought that garment back into use again, which was quite important, you know, a lot of those people. We've had a few podcasts where we've had people who do visible mending, and that's why I asked the question. Yeah, yeah. It's become really popular recently, hasn't it? And I hope it stays around and not just popular. It's quite a fundamental, important part of owning clothes I think and owning textiles and having a kind of a skill and let's face it, it's not not a new thing is it no there's a lot of history behind it yeah it's fascinating we had Kate Sekulis on the podcast and so she's got a lot of the history in her book about mending yeah I've got her book her book's great and two new ones that I've got recently at Erin Fitzgerald had one out recently which is great and Katrina wrote about her make thrift mend that's a that's a nice book as well Mm. I'm sure most people that are into mending know of Tom of Holland and I know him from Brighton he has got awesome skills he is just incredible at whatever he turns his hand to mending is a really good way of expressing yourself and creating art and also It's a kind of like a non-risky way of getting into sewing and making. There's not that, oh God, I don't want to cut the fabric because I might do it wrong. I might sew it together wrong. Well, you're kind of fixing something in the first place and quite often you're doing it by hand. So there's not that worry of it might go wrong. Well, you know, if you think it's gone wrong, you can just unpick it and do it again, which is the beauty of it as well. What sort of feedback have you had from people who had previously bought your other books and now they've looked at how to sew sustainably? Yes, and I'll be completely honest, I was a bit apprehensive because it is quite different to my other books. There was a part of me that did think, I wonder how this is going to go down. I always find it a really nerve-wracking time anyway when a book first comes out and even though I've done five, you know, there's people that have done far more than me, but even though I've done five, that time, it's never any less nerve wracking because it's this thing that you've put everything into Mm -hmm. and is so personal and you think it's great, but then you're just putting it out there in the world for anyone to say whatever they like about. And that's the modern world, isn't it? But it's been lovely to get such really nice feedback about it so far. It seems to have been really, really well received so far, which is which is wonderful. Such a relief. Yeah. <laughs> Good on you. <laughs> Hopefully, I think it's partly because I like to think it's it's a really accessible book. Hopefully, that's that's what I like to think about it. So the clothing projects that are in there, there are no patterns. And I know a lot of people don't like that process of 
tracing off pattern pieces and when you're working with patterns obviously then you've got that extra level of choosing a size and possibly making adaptations and changes to it finding your size is not covered all of that kind of stuff so and a lot of the clothing projects can be made for men or women or even kids because there's no patterns it's all based on measurements so measuring your body but then also using your own preference of how loose or fitted or what length or there's a lot of personal choice in it and the fact that there's not just dressmaking there's a range of stuff in there and there's some hand sewing hopefully it does make it a bit more accessible what do you want people to get from having this book in their library what do you want to leave our listeners with I hope it enables people or gives people some inspiration to just look at their materials and what they do a bit differently. Be a bit more considered about what they choose to make, what fabrics they choose, how they use their fabrics and what's left over after a project that that can be a really inspiring source of material for another project. Yeah, yeah just, just sort of thinking outside the box a little bit, really. Wendy, thank you so much for being on Sales and I Style and talking us through so sustainably and what it really means to you. You're welcome. It's been really nice to talk to you, Maria. Thanks for having me on. Thank you. And have a lovely day, listeners. This episode of So Organised Style podcast for... So Over 50 to support hashtag So 50 Sustainable Sewing was produced by me, Maria Thea Harris, with permission of Wendy Ward, sound by bensound.com. You can subscribe to So Organized Style Podcast, spelt with an S, not a Z, on all good podcast apps and give us a five star rating and review. You can also support us on our Patreon account. Make sure you listen to our previous free So Over 50 podcasts and hear from great people from the Sew 50 community. All so Organised Style podcasts are free to keep you company and make you smile. Post any questions or podcast suggestions you have on our podcast website at seworganisedstyle.com or on our Instagram account, Sew Organised Style, or on our Facebook page. We look forward to joining you in your sewing room next time. Stay safe, everyone. <laughs>